Hello, I'm Patsy Ponder Dalton, and I'm so pleased to present Carla Washington, PhD, social worker, researcher, and clinician for family caregiving. She has studied family caregiving in the context of serious illness for the past 15 years. Carla and I want to emphasize both the heart and the science of caring for someone with Parkinson's disease. So we're using a discussion format, weaving information based on Carla's experiences studying caregiving families and my experiences caring for my husband since he was diagnosed with Parkinson's 27 years ago. So to get things started, Carla, tell us about your research. Well, first, thank you so much for having me today, and I'm really excited to get to talk with you about both the heart and the science of caregiving. And I guess the first thing I would emphasize to family caregivers is that when you think about research in serious illness care, oftentimes what comes to mind is a laboratory setting. And um, maybe someone's behind a microscope studying medicines to slow an illness or prevent an illness, or in some cases, cure an illness. And certainly we have that research going on in Parkinson's disease and it's very exciting. In addition, we have the kind of research I do. And I'm one of literally hundreds of individuals who study family caregiving. So the work we do isn't inside the lab. Uh, we do work in people's homes, in the community. We have conversations like you and I are having today, learning about how people care for one another and how we can help support family caregivers in the job that they're doing. So there are some national organizations that we refer to often, uh, like the American Parkinson's Disease Association, the Parkinson's Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I know you recommend those, don't you? Absolutely, and I really, really want to emphasize to individuals who are in caregiving roles that as a taxpayer, you are funding millions, literally millions of dollars of family caregiving research. So connecting with those organizations you mentioned is so important. They're a terrific resource, and you as a family caregiver are the intended beneficiary of all that work that's happening. I'm so pleased to see that the AARP and other sources of information are really kicking in, too, for caregivers. It's like we've been discovered. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, our second question. What changes have you seen in the field? Wow, over time, one of the things that really stands out to me is that years and years ago, uh, we thought about family caregivers as playing more of a passive role in healthcare. You know, they brought patients to medical visits, they sometimes went into medical visits, listened to information, um, sometimes received instructions, right, and carried out that care plan. Um, and that was kind of a, a, a model that, that for years we really thought was the best way to go. What we're learning uh, increasingly is that family caregivers are not content idly sitting by. It's probably the result of a number of different factors. One certainly is the baby boomers aging. That's not a generation of people who like a more passive role um, in, a, in a general statement. And so we're seeing people um, who are writing about family caregivers using words like activated, empowered, engaged. Um, and one of the roles that we see family caregivers really stepping into is a role of an advocate. Um, and some people, I'm guessing, you work with some family caregivers who are really natural advocates, right? They stand into their power. They, uh, they don't uh, shy away from more difficult discussions. But for some family caregivers, that can be a difficult transition. There are certainly individuals, some of whom are, are maybe more naturally drawn to a caregiving role, who have really been socialized to be nice. You know, we have those expressions, um, you attract more flies with honey than vinegar, we go along to get along. Um, sometimes that's a really gendered value, that can be maybe a Midwestern value. Um, and so for some people it can be really difficult uh, to learn how to advocate to be more assertive um, in medical encounters. Or one of the areas we're really doing a lot of research in is family relationships. Uh, because really, when family members work together to provide sort of group caregiving, we know that that can present some challenges. I was working a few years ago with a family, and I'm going to get this wrong as far as their specific jobs, but I want to say someone was a nurse and someone was a physician 
and maybe someone was a pharmacist or an attorney, uh, regardless of what their specific jobs were, if you were to look on paper at these individuals, you would think this was a dream team as far as family caregiving went. Really accomplished individuals um, who had jobs that were really pertinent to health care, and they were really having a heck of a time getting along negotiating, figuring out those family relationships. The same communication skills and strategies they used at work were not working in their family relationships. And it took a lot of change and growth on their part to be able to work together. Does that sound like something that you hear from families you work with? Yes, very frequently, especially in caregiver groups. Uh, it isn't anyone's fault, exactly. I mean, there's the caregiver who's there on a day-to-day -day basis, and they deal with all of these things that come along. And then the other siblings or other family members come in and often they have suggestions and maybe they're even upset about how some things have been done. And it's so hard that on the caregiver to hear that and to have to deal with that in addition to the daily care. We worked on a, a study years ago and coined a term social support burden which I rather liked because for, for years we've known that social support is such an important piece of caregiving, right? And it's helpful in lots of different ways. But one of the things that really hadn't been studied much is how much stress it can cause to involve other people in a caregiving role. And I'm thinking about a woman I met uh, while we were conducting that study, and she said, she said, you're doing so much work and you're just exhausted. And you think, surely, uh, people are somewhere, you know, planning a party for you. They're arranging for a parade. And she said, no, they're somewhere talking bad about you. Um, and, and she really was really speaking, to, again, to that social support burden, to the extra stress that having individuals involved can cause. And of course, though, if we can figure out how to help family caregivers engage their social support network, it can be such an advantage. But that um, requires some negotiation um, and sometimes some growth and, and skill development, and that can be really tough. I've noticed in some cases when you go to the physician's uh, visits with your loved one, that sometimes the nurse will ask the caregiver, so how are you doing? How are things at home? Uh, how is your health? Uh, is this a new trend or is this just something that some people are really good at asking? Well, so I, I think both. I certainly hope it's a trend that we're going to see more and more of. Increasingly, we're training healthcare providers to think of patients and their families as a unit of care. And so, of course, as healthcare teams, when we support family caregivers, we empower them and enable them to provide good patient care, which is certainly part of our job. But increasingly, healthcare providers are recognizing, hey, we also just have this caregiver who's his or her own person, um, has their own needs and wants and hopes and fears, and asking questions, even simple questions like you mentioned, hey, how are you doing with all of this, can go a really long way. So hopefully we're hearing more about that. And I think one of the other changes we've seen in the field is, um, even just as recently as a few decades ago, everything you read about family caregiving was about stress. And everything we did to support people was sort of about coping. And, and really this was, um, there was an idea that caregiving was this wholly negative, stressful experience. And of course it can be incredibly stressful. But one of the things we're learning, especially in our research studies, um, oftentimes when we finish an interview, we'll ask a question like, hey, what did we not talk about that's important for me to know if I want to understand your experience? And increasingly, family caregivers say, you haven't asked anything about what I like about it um, or um, the ways that it fulfills me. We, uh, and then when we listen, we hear things like, you know, I'm learning so much. Or, you know, I really stood up for my mom today, and that's not something that was easy for me. I feel really proud of myself. Or um, maybe families or, or individuals who have relationships that have been strained or even just a little aloof or distant. And, and you hear people talk about, I feel really very close to this person now to have shared this experience. And it's tricky because you certainly don't want to negate the fact that it's also sad and scary and hard and exhausting. But it can be both things. And I'm really, really excited that the field is making space for that uh, to appreciate both the stressful aspects and the positive aspects. Because what we know from research is that spending time acknowledging and thinking about those positive aspects goes a long way to support caregiver well-being. Right. 
You know, I, I often said, uh, especially in the first few years, I realized that by being with David at a time when he had Parkinson's disease and a slowly moving disease in his case, I got to have him in my life for so long. Some of my friends lost their loved ones to things like heart attacks, things like that. So we've grown closer and closer and closer in all of these years of challenges coming along. So I think that's a benefit if you can look at some benefits. Um, also, caregivers struggle quite a lot with some hospital or some doctor visits where they go in and they need to talk to the doctor about some really sensitive things, uh, like driving. That's a big issue, and you know that. Yes. <laughs> Private issues like sexual difficulties or different behaviors from before. Is this something that we should keep working toward? Absolutely, and, and one of the, the things that caregivers often talk about, you know, we're training healthcare providers to ask about information preferences. It's, uh, uh, there's a, a phrase that goes something like, with regard to disease progression, for example, we're training healthcare providers to say, how much would you like me to tell you about what you can expect uh, from your illness over time. And, and so we're asking those questions. We've done a study very recently of family caregivers and they are, are saying they asked the patient and maybe I was in the room, but no one asked me separately. And maybe the individual living with Parkinson's disease uh, is not incredibly interested at that moment in hearing what to expect over time. But I really want to know. I feel like I need to know. And so my preferences are really very different. And I'm not sure we're to the point now where all healthcare providers are really appreciating that there might be differences in terms of information sharing between patients and caregivers. So I love that you're pointing that out. And the family caregivers we've talked to who have even said, um, you know, pulled aside a nurse or a physician, sent some communication and said, I really have things I'd like to talk to you about privately. Um, those have been such beneficial steps caregivers have taken and really, really valuable exchanges for the healthcare team. And it's certainly not the job of the family caregiver to educate the provider, right? It's not your job as a family caregiver to make us better, but it does uh, because people hear that and they remember it next time. And I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> we have another question for you. Are there challenges that family caregiving researchers have been tackling for a long time and what hasn't really changed? Yeah, what have we been doing a lot of for a really long time? You know, I think the top one uh, is, is really caregiver self-care, which at this point people hear about so much, it almost sounds like an empty platitude. Uh, you know, years ago we would always say, what was the thing about the air, well, we, um, uh, on an airplane, you know, if the oxygen mask comes down, you put yours on first before you help someone else. And we had these things, and, and we've really been uh, been trying to communicate that message for a really long time. Um, and it's still as important as it once was, and I hope we're getting better with the messaging because two things, one of which is it's not really um, an inconsequential piece of caregiving. Self-neglect of the caregiver has really serious consequences. I did a study, um, gosh, I guess it was five years ago now, and we were setting up our database. And so this study required frequent contacts with family caregivers. And so our research staff, if they were unable to reach the caregiver, they needed to tick a box to indicate why they couldn't reach them. And so we had a box that just read hospitalized. And when we were creating the form, we intended that box to be checked when the patient was in the hospital. And in fact, uh, I can't decide whether this will be surprising to you or not. Do you know where I'm going with this? Yes, I think so. <laughs> so more often, we checked the box because it was the family caregiver who was in the hospital. And I, when I work with family caregivers, and, and you know, I, I don't say this and then leave, we usually make a plan, but I say, you know, if you can't get away for four hours to go on a walk, to get your hair done, to go to the dentist, to go to the eye doctor, um, what are you going to do when you're in the hospital for the weekend? Uh, and that's really where we start a lot of conversations about self-care. I think the other thing about self-care that um, we really can continue to emphasize is people have this idea that it's a spa day, right? There's a lot of pedicures involved in massages and self-care, and that can be a great part of self-care, but it's also things like saying no 
when people make requests of you that you don't really want to do or you don't have the bandwidth to do. It's setting firm boundaries. It's uh, really standing up for yourself. We know over time in relationships, if you sacrifice your own needs, your own self-esteem, one of two things happens. You end the relationship or you blow up. And neither are desirable outcomes. And so really self-care isn't just about um, sort of these pampering pieces. It's things that you might not even want to do, right? It's going out for that walk, going to the dentist, going to counseling, um, or even just getting some time away. And it's still such an important piece of the puzzle. Um, I think one of the other pieces that, that we um, have been really attending to for a really long time that's still true is helping, um, helping family caregivers and individuals who are living with serious illness think ahead um, and plan for the future. And, and so um, one of the things we know about Parkinson's disease is it's a progressive illness. And absolutely, we talk to people who say things like, I want to take things one day at a time. Or even, you know, one of the strategies we teach as a coping skill is mindfulness, right? Stay in the present moment. But when you actually talk to people, oftentimes the elephant in the room in the present moment is that this is going to change in the future. And so we really, really emphasize to families, especially if people are feeling well enough that the individual with a serious illness can be part of those conversations, to talk about what is really ahead in the future. Right, right. Um, I think you're exactly on target there. It's hard for all of us. Uh, we, wanna, we have to be planners. Uh, to get the day uh, finished out, we have to know what's going to happen the next day and all that. On the other hand, it's kind of hard to plan for the future when you're dealing with Parkinson's. And I think one of the greatest fears we all have as caregivers is, and I know I say this all the time, what's going to happen if something happens to me? I mean, what do I have in place? And as easy as it is to ask that, th that question, it's difficult to find that answer. I think it can be difficult to find that answer. And I'm also really struck by uh, the courage it takes to, to consider that scary thing happening. And one of the things we absolutely know is having those difficult conversations, being brave enough to think about what's really the worst case scenario, right? Let's hope for the best, but mm -hmm. let's see if we can have a plan in place mm -hmm. for when things are really, really problematic. And so um, one of the things we know is exactly as you said, that plan, being proactive Thinking ahead, having a plan, having a social support network can be so key. Because when we work with families who, for a variety of reasons, have not really thought ahead, mm -hmm. it's often the case that a crisis happens, right? Something comes to a head, and then people have to make decisions quickly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it works out, but more often than not, the outcome of that problem solving is much, much worse than if somebody had had time to plan ahead to do things like meet with private caregiving companies, if that's something that a family caregiver um, has the resources to do. Um, you know, it's not uncommon that people with Parkinson's disease and other serious illnesses at some point in their illness trajectory might live somewhere other than the home that they'd spent most of their life in. I have um, uh, an acquaintance actually whose uh, family member has Parkinson's disease and they're living in a three-story townhome. Mm -hmm. And is this a really sustainable choice over line? Maybe, uh, maybe this is something that can be sustained over time, but it's possible uh, that some changes need to be made. And if you can make those in a thoughtful, non-crisis situation, uh, we just see that the outcome is often much, much stronger. And then my colleagues on healthcare teams would absolutely um, want me to remind people that there are healthcare decisions that we could all, as adults, make in advance, right? We can all have those conversations about what we would want in terms of medical treatment if we weren't able to make decisions about those things. Um, but that's certainly the case for individuals who have a serious illness. Those discussions become even more important. And um, one key consideration is, again, having those discussions, planning ahead, especially if the person with a serious illness is well enough or um, maybe, it, it, as with Parkinson's disease, some individuals experience cognitive changes over time, and they might not be equipped later in the disease progression to be involved in those discussions in a really meaningful way. And so we really do have a window of opportunity 
where with some thoughtful planning, we can change the outcomes for both patients and family caregivers. And I really encourage people to take advantage of that. And so when you say that, you really mean getting out there and doing your research, getting specific answers, asking about waiting times to get into a facility if that's the way you're headed? Yes, especially, in, and this varies, uh, this varies by the part of the country you live in. However, many, many parts of the country, people don't think about, there are waiting lists mm -hmm. um, to, to get into um, to different types of long-term care facilities, for example. There are certain personalities that different mm -hmm. facilities can have. You know, you'll oftentimes hear about someone who will say, oh, I would never, ever want to live here. And then you talk to someone and they say, oh my gosh, <laughs> my husband lived there for 13 years right. and, and that was the perfect spot for him. And so you don't know until you go, absolutely, there are waiting lists. I think one of the things um, that we're hearing more about, so it's not always as much of a shock, but really the financial resources it takes to pull together a plan like that are, are pretty significant and take a lot of planning. And, and that's the sort of thing that if you plan ahead, um, that you can see some really significant differences in outcomes compared to if you just wait until there's a crisis situation. I have to tell you, in our support groups, uh, we have programs on this uh, all the time. We have uh, opportunities for caregivers to talk amongst themselves about this. Uh, one of the big questions we always get is, how do you know when it may be time to move to a different living facility? What do you look for as far as changes or uh, activities? Uh, because this is hard when you're there every day, you may not see some changes and other people who come to visit do. And I think that can be one of the real frustrations for family caregivers because it's not uncommon that family caregivers will talk to their healthcare team and say, right. I want you to tell me when the right time is. And increasingly, uh, we're hearing uh, healthcare providers who say, I, I can't know when the right time is for you. Um, but what I will say is having a sense of what you would like that to look like ahead of time mm -hmm. uh, is incredibly helpful because sometimes there is a significant health event that really pushes things along. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, we talked before about you know family caregivers who are hospitalized or who have significant uh, health events or, or events in their own lives and are unable to continue caregiving. Um, you know, certainly the physical realities of caregiving are something that we probably don't pay enough attention to. Um, and I'm telling you things I'm sure you already know and that you hear from family caregivers. But physically, family caregiving can be really, really very hard. Um, and so really mobility limitations can really be the reason why someone um, ends up in a different situation. And I, I really want to emphasize that oftentimes we have sort of this all or nothing idea about where individuals live. And so we think you're in this multi-level private residence uh, where you've always lived, or you're in a lockdown long-term care facility with 24-hour care. And there's so much in between. Um, and there are instances, for example, when um, especially for, for individuals who are partnered or married and have been for a really long time, there are absolutely places where a family caregiver and an individual with a serious illness can live together. There are ways that family caregivers can preserve their own home and, and sort of financially protect um, their home and still be able to spend time and, and, and live with an individual with a serious illness. So those are all things um, that planning ahead can do. And I think to your point about when, Thinking about it as a process as opposed to flipping a switch can also be really helpful. Would it make sense um, for someone whose significant other is having serious physical decline uh, to just, let's go have lunch somewhere, see if we like it. Maybe you hate the food. Right. That's one of the things when we work with families and individuals who are um, living away from home. Um, some of those pieces, uh, just even the physical environment, let's go check some places out. Um, and again, pretending like that's not even a possibility um, can be detrimental because for some individuals, um, it might be. You might also find that it's not going to work. And so you might want to involve lots of supports in the home. I think that's the other piece uh, that we really emphasize is that there's a significant financial reality to living somewhere other in the home. And so for a lot of families pulling in additional supports, um, interviewing different companies, asking questions. You know, we're talking today in Columbia, Missouri. I will tell you the availability 
for private duty nursing services in the home is very different in the middle of summer when all the students have gone than it is at the height of fall. And so thinking about those things, and you won't know those things, especially for your community, if you don't talk to other family caregivers, it would be really hard. And so that's one of the things I'm most impressed about your community is that you have numerous opportunities for people to get together right. to um, learn the things that aren't gonna be on the brochure, mm -hmm. to hear about the experiences and, and the things to expect. I think it's such a strength of, of what you've done and, and what your entire community's done, and I really applaud you. Thank you. I have just a few more things I wanted to ask you because we've got you captured here. Uh, these are words that come up with caregivers and these are words that carry a lot of power. One of the words is frustration. And that frustration can be because of the changes that are occurring sometimes daily. You may get used to one thing and then the very next day something has changed and you don't know if it's going to change again or not. Do you run into that all the time with caregivers? Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the first things we, we try and do is um, uh, we have a, a problem solving process we teach. And, and many people have learned it um, in, in business settings, work settings, school settings, right? This really systematic way that you tackle problems. And, and at first when we started, um, so we talk about this in terms of delivering interventions, but when we first started supporting caregivers in this way, we really worried. You know, we were talking to really... Um, people who had very sophisticated careers, really high-powered individuals, and we thought, wow, am I going to teach them five steps to solve problems? And they're going to think, yeah, I know. <laughs> right. uh, but one of the things that we heard is people had just said, wow, this actually lets me think about things instead of just feeling everything, right? right? And mm -hmm. so taking some time to record the facts of a situation, to really take a couple days and brainstorm even ridiculous possible solutions and really go through a systematic process of thinking, how is this going to affect me as a caregiver, right? Because you matter mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. How is this going to affect the individual I'm caring for? What about the rest of my family? How are these consequences likely to play out in the short term, in the long term? And then really working with someone to develop a plan to, to tackle a problem. We know that having people in your life who provide a, emotional support and validation is so important, right? You may have experienced this. I'm sure lots of family caregivers have. Just calling and venting to someone mm -hmm. can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And there's a point at which it sometimes doesn't do the trick. You really have a problem and just talking about it doesn't feel better anymore and you really want to move forward. And so introducing a systematic process to where you can consider problems cognitively instead of just being overwhelmed with emotion can be so important. And I really encourage people uh, to adopt such a strategy. Uh, one of the other words that comes up, and it's not a happy one, is guilt. Um, we as caregivers often think, well, I, I could do better. I'll do better than I did yesterday. Or uh, maybe I'm wishing that I was elsewhere. And I feel guilty about that. Uh, maybe having to make decisions, and you're not sure you've made the right decision. Do you run into that one too? Absolutely, and one of the most powerful experiences people have, and, and this may be true for your support groups as well, when they interact with other caregivers, is someone will be brave enough to say something like, mm -hmm. wow, the other day I wondered what my life is going to be like after uh, maybe my, my wife has died. I, I thought I might take a trip, or would I continue to live in this house? I was thinking about my life after this person, and I feel like a monster yeah. to do that. And then what you notice, though, in the room is heads nodding, right? And people are saying, oh, I've, I've felt that way, too. And, and it's a normal part of the process, and, and we know that cognitively. But to be in a physical space or, or even via Zoom doing something remotely where you hear that from other people can be incredibly powerful uh, in really recognizing that it's normal. It's healthy uh, to think about... Um, wanting to be somewhere else, to think about wishing things were different. It would, be, um, it would be abnormal not to, but I think that's where that social support, especially from individuals who've been through what you've been through, can be so key. Is this where the words anticipatory grief come in? Is this what we're experiencing? <clears throat> so, so it's two things, one of which is, so we use the term anticipatory grief to refer to the fact that when you are, when you love someone who has a serious illness that you know is life limiting, you are thinking ahead, right, to when 
to when they won't be here anymore. And, and that can be sad and scary. And so all of those things go into, uh, into anticipatory grief. Then you also have the reality that you're not even just anticipating losses, you're experiencing losses. Maybe you thought you were gonna spend your retirement at the Lake of the Ozarks, right? Maybe you have, maybe the way that you uh, are intimate with a spouse has really changed and you miss that. So you're having real losses in real time grief and at the same time, you're looking ahead uh, to a time when an individual has died and having that anticipatory grief as well. So it's definitely both. Uh, and those are both incredibly powerful experiences that again, just acknowledging goes really a long way um, toward coping with. And also with regard to anticipatory grief, um, cutting yourself some slack uh, and, and knowing that thinking about the future is part of what we do as humans. It's how we survive and it really is a survival skill. Right, right. We have talked about anticipatory grief a lot at our group meetings and it is something that all of us say we have and we do. And sometimes it almost feels like a rehearsal for the future and uh, it's helpful. I, I refuse to think of it as a negative thing, <laughs> you know. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we've hit most of the big topics today, and uh, we know this is a, a really uh, huge issue for most of us who never expected to be caregivers in our lives. Uh, we all know there's a lot of life to live, and so we have to do a good job of living it and being as positive as we can be. Uh, but we also have to be realistic and know that we have to deal with the day-to-day -day challenges. Is there anything you want to close us out with today? I think I'm going to steal something from you. <laughs> okay, fine with me. I, I really love that phrase, and with your permission, I'll be using it uh, with my research participants and family caregivers for years. There is a lot of life left to live. Um, today, while you're caregiving, your life is not on hold. This is your life. Um, and, and there's a lot of life for you in the future. Taking care of yourself, experiencing joy because it is still out there, and cutting yourself some slack, giving yourself space to be human can be so important. And then the other piece that uh, I will say is a, a representative of society is you are doing billions of dollars of work. You are really what's keeping our society afloat and we uh, are incredibly grateful to you for the care that you provide to your family caregivers. We know we're all going to be um, caring for someone at some point in our lives and, and many, many thanks uh, for all that you do. Thank you, Carla, and we thank you because with your research, hopefully this will make everything so much better, so much um, more manageable for all of us in the future. Thank you. Thanks.